There's a letter from the Friedrich Rebbe, amazing, where the Rebbe says that there's a mitzvah of Yidiyas Hashem. Rambam begins with it, Rambam ends with it. We write it on the Aron Kodesh, Dalif Nei Miata Emed. You have to know, Yediyas Hashem. So amazingly, the Vedic Rebbe writes that Yediyas Hashem is only a Hechsher Mitzvah. You don't fulfill the Mitzvah of Yediyas Hashem until you reach Havana. What is the difference between Yediyah and Havana? Yediyah you can get from somebody else. Somebody tells you something, explains it to you, you read it in a mimer, so you know. You know, how do you know that? It says in the mimer. So now you know, you do know. And you understand it. It's not like uh, you just heard a, a slogan. But that's all you do. You don't really fulfill the mitzvah until you attain some havana. And havana means maven dover metech dover. From what idea you received, you come to a new insight and a new conclusion, what the Rebbe calls a seichel chodosh. If you take what you learned and you analyze it carefully, and it leads you to a new conclusion that the Maimed did not say, that's called a seichel chodosh. For you, it's a seichel chodosh. And now you're fulfilling the mitzvah. <clears throat> this mitzvah, I have a feeling, is somewhat neglected. I don't remember in yeshiva ever hearing this. You have to chazer a maimer, you have to memorize a maimer, you have to say it balpeh, you have to um, understand what it says. If you have a kasha, you have to answer it. It didn't... It wasn't encouraged at all that you have to think the subject through until you come to a new insight. And only then do you fulfill the mitzvah of Yediyas Hashem. That's pretty um, revolutionary. So how do we go about this? Now, the JLI courses, when they deal with these big questions of what is Emuna, what is the Ebrishter, how do you get to know the Ebrishter, this is very helpful. But it's only helpful if it encourages you and inspires you to go back to the Maimur and really get to understand what it says until it's your Seichel. Now, how do you know it's your seichel? If you can say it in your own words, without using the Hebrew, without using the code words, explain what it says without, without using chassidish language. In other words, say it in English, but not translate it into English. Take the idea and present the idea in English without the Hebrew special language. That's, that's challenging. But then you know that you really understand. So when people ask you in your classes and in your, in your shiurim, when people ask you these kinds of questions, you want to be able to answer them from your own understanding, not quote to them what is written. For two reasons. First of all, if you quote to them what is written, they don't understand. If you don't thoroughly understand it, and you're quoting it to them and translating it into English that is not really a proper translation, and even if it is, it doesn't explain anything, so they end up not understanding. 
and they walk away with a taste of um, hopelessness. I'll never understand this. This doesn't make any sense. Because the rabbi is trying to explain it. He's doing his best, and it's not working. So obviously this subject is just not knowable. Or maybe I'm not spiritual enough, or maybe I'm not philosophical enough. And they give up. And that shouldn't happen. But if it sounds like it's coming from you, you understand it, and you're saying what you know about the subject, your balabatim are just as smart. If it makes sense to you, it will make sense to them. <clears throat> so, one of the things that gets in the way is when we confuse Yediya and Emunah, or Yediya and Havana. If I know the Maimer and I can repeat it, doesn't that mean I understand it? No, yes or no. You understand what it says, but you still have nothing to say. And like we were saying, in the name of the Fir de that means you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah of your Diyas Hashem. But, and I'm not so worried about fulfilling the mitzvah as the thing itself. The lack of understanding, the lack of Havana. And when the Rebbe said that teaching others and uh, doing, uh, doing shlichus with others is not only for the benefit of the others, but it's m even primarily for the benefit of the shliach himself. It is so obvious when it comes to explaining godliness. You're doing yourself so much more, for yourself so much more than you're doing for your student. And is this what it means? Nasa meiche v'li beizakim elef pamim kochom? Maybe. Maybe. So let's understand a little bit. What constitutes emuna and what constitutes yediya? As a general rule, and see if this, this makes sense to you. When you hear something that you've never heard before, if you if you accept what the person is saying, would that constitute emuna? Say it in English. If somebody tells you something you've never heard before and you believe him, is that called belief? You believe him. You trust him. Is that called betochen? Is that called faith? So when a person hears something they never heard before and he says, oh, I don't believe that. You don't believe it? You're calling me a liar? You're saying, I am not trustworthy? On the other hand, if you say, oh, yeah, I believe that. So you're trusting me? In other words, if I share a piece of information with you, I'm not asking you for your allegiance. I'm not asking you to worship me. I'm telling you something. And you say, okay. Are you in fact believing me? How do we use this word belief? You ask somebody what time it is. And he says it's 8.30. You're going to believe him? If you trust him that it is 8.30, is that an act of faith? What is it? When you hear some piece of information, there is no element of, of faith. There's no element of emunah here. There's a chazaka. person tells you something, there's a chazaka that he's probably telling you what he knows. And if he knows it, now you know it too. 
So why do we believe each other? Why do we trust each other? I was talking to Dr. Black Oliver Shalom, and he was saying philosophically as a philosopher, he was saying that what is the most necessary, the most crucial um, characteristic that makes life livable in this world? Some people say love, some people say kindness, some people say tzedakah. He said, trust. If I can't trust what you tell me, all society breaks down and we will be, go back to the, to, the, to living in caves. Or we would never have come out of the caves. The most crucial part of, of civilization is people assuming that, that what you hear from others is factual. Not the truth with a capital T, but factual. Here's a strange example. Do you believe in ghosts? Let's listen to this. A person who says, I don't believe in ghosts. This is a total fool. This is pure nonsense. I come to you and I say, do you believe in ghosts? And you say, no. What does no mean? What do you mean no? You're convinced that there are no ghosts. What is a ghost? You really don't know. But you're already de determined that there are no, there's no such thing. Is that not phobia? You're ghost phobic? Is that not superstition? To say I don't believe in ghosts, is that not superstition? If superstition means taking an opinion that is not based on reality, having a position, having a, a stance that you came to for no reason except fear, that's not superstition. So who's really superstitious? The person who thinks that there are ghosts or the person who's convinced that there are none? So two things. First of all, to believe that something isn't is already foolish. Because there's no way you can know that it's not. I don't know if we need to develop this any further. A guy says, my house is haunted. You go there with a camera. You do all sorts of tests with sound and with, and there's no sound and there's no image. There's nothing there. So now you know there's no such thing as ghosts. First of all, your equipment is all wrong. You can't take a picture of a ghost. Secondly, you have now determined possibly that there is no ghost in this house. To say there's no such thing as a ghost? Further argument. People have been talking about ghosts for as long as, as people have been around. How can such a non-existent, meaningless concept last so long? everywhere in the world. So at the very least, when somebody says there's a ghost, you should inquire, what do you mean by a ghost? What is a ghost? Find out what people are talking about before you dismiss it. That would be an intelligent approach. <clears throat> so the same thing is true with people who say, I don't believe in God. You can't not believe in God. It's totally foolish. People talk about God for all of history. Find out what they're talking about. Figure out what they mean. 
And even if you can't, you certainly cannot be sure that there's none. Can't. So, if somebody were to say, 3,000 years ago, the Ebershteh came down to Har Sinai and he gave us the Ten Commandments. And some listener says, oh, I don't believe that. There's nothing to talk about. There's, there's, no, there's no basis for a discussion. You read the Rebbe's letters, the Rebbe's answers to people, and, and he's so patient. He's so respectful of the question. And what does the Rebbe say? Two million people stood at Har Sinai and they said that God gave the Ten Commandments. What is your problem? What's your problem? No? Why, why no? What no? Do you have conflicting information? Do you know something that contradicts the statement? Were you there, Imanu Hayisem, and you can testify that God never came that day? So you have no intelligent objection whatsoever, none. So your refusal to believe it is superstitious. You decided based on nothing what your belief is going to be. So when the Rebbe answers like that, you know, you say, oh, well, yeah, sure. Here, two million people, three million people, they saw it, they tried, they passed it on to their children. You know, when you boil it down to the simple, people had an experience, you say no. You know what their experience was? And if two million people say they had an experience, you're not interested? This is called intelligent? This is called open-minded? This is called intellectual? To an intellectual, every new piece of information is exciting. So instead of saying, oh, I never heard that before, say, wow, I never heard that before. Which one is more intelligent? Intelligent. So when a person says, yeah, I believe, I believe in God, don't be superstitious. <coughs> there is no need for faith. If you're talking about God's existence, God is a fact of history. People have had encounters with God. You want to know more? Study it. You don't want to know? Fine. Don't bring in a moon. That's a definition of intelligence. Now, what is a moon? Amuna means a certainty that goes way beyond experience or intellectual argument. No one is as sure of anything as a person who has real Amuna. It's a certainty that nothing else can produce. So, when a person says, you know, if I could see it, if I could hear it, if I could touch it, then I would know it was real. Not, not so. How real are your senses? You see a table, it looks like a solid, stationary piece of wood. You look under the microscope, it's not solid, it's not stationary, it's not wood. So your senses? You can't rely on your senses. You thought you saw, it appeared to be, you heard something, you're not sure what you heard. Intellectually, you come up with the best argument and the best proof that something is true. You can't be sure. You're only as sure as the proof, as the argument. 
obviously somebody smarter can come along and give you a better argument and convince you that it's not true. And it'll make just as much sense. In fact, that's the nature of intelligence, that there's always another side to the argument. If you think that there's only one possible answer to this question, you're not intellectual anymore. You've stopped thinking. You're dogmatic. Which sometimes is a good thing, but it's not intelligent. An intelligent person can always find the other side of the argument. Certainly someone more intelligent than you can find you a better argument that disproves your argument. Isaac Newton was a very smart guy and he had some solid proofs that what he was saying was correct. And Einstein came along and said, eh, love Dafke. So where does Amuna come from? Only a person with Amuna is absolutely certain of what is. His Amuna makes him certain. His intelligence does not and his senses do not. So the argument, you know, if you could prove it to me, then I would believe it. No, if I could prove it to you, you would not believe it. You would be content with the proof and you would not be 100% sure. So what possible source is there in the human being that can produce for him a muna that makes it absolutely certain, unquestionable, non, non negotiable, and no matter what kind of proof you bring to the opposite, his amuna doesn't change, it's rock solid. That doesn't come from the mind and it doesn't come from the heart. It comes from something much bigger. When something MS introduces itself into your system, then you have a muna. In other words, the, the thing you believe in convinced you, not you convinced yourself. In intelligence, you convince yourself. You give yourself a good explanation, you like the explanation, you're convinced. But emuna means something really true, something really real, made itself known to you. So how can your argument disprove it? And that's why seeing is believing. What is seeing? Seeing means the object entered my eye and presented itself to me. It showed itself to me. So what did I see? I saw it. If I see it, then that's really it. If I imagine what it looks like, I may be all wrong. But if it shows itself to me, how can that be wrong? That's what it is. How do I know? It showed itself to me. So the knowledge is coming from it. That's much more convincing, much more real, much more certain than any process I can go through to reach a conclusion. Even seeing, physical seeing. So seeing is believing is not exactly the same. It has the same... A principle that what's real showed itself to me. So where does the Amuna happen? In the Neshama. The Neshama sees the Eibishter. So the Eibishter is who he is and what he is because, because he's, the, he's right there. So the Neshama sees the Eibishter. Some of that awareness, some of that um, sensation of the neshama trickles down and makes itself felt in the mind and in the heart, that's called emunah.
that has nothing to do with yidiya. So when a person says, what do I do if I don't believe? Make it clear. What does belief mean? And what does knowledge mean? <clears throat> Obviously, if your grandfather tells you that Matan Torah happened 3,000 years ago at Har Sinai, you now know. Do you know with absolute conviction? You know it the way you know anything else. Any other statement about history, about yesterday, about a place you never went to, you heard about it, you know about it, and you trust it. That's not emuna. That's just sanity. Whereas people who are a little bit insecure, they've been lied to, and they've been embarrassed by the fact that they accepted a Baba Misa, and everybody laughed at them for it. And since then, everything they hear that they're not already familiar with, they don't trust. Not they don't trust the person. They don't trust themselves. If I accept what you're telling me, I might make a fool of myself, and I can't afford that. So I become cynical, I become skeptical, I become, uh, I become callous. I can't afford to let myself trust. Of course, that trust has nothing to do with betochen in, in the Ebershtim. <coughs> so, when the, when the Fidik Rebbe says that in order to fulfill the mitzvah, you have to have a Havana in Alakus. Don't confuse it with Amuna. Yediyah can be confused with Amuna. I know it and I accept it. I'll give you a little example. I mentioned that the Rebbe in, in the Rishimus tells the story that the, the, the Fiedik Rebbe told him that he saw the Rebbe Rasha being Maver Sedra and he was dissolving into the sweetness of Elokus. What is the sweetness of Elokus? Vayemer Hashem El Avram. When the Rebbe Rashab read those words, the sweetness of it was overwhelming and he cried from pleasure. That's the idea. Now you know. You think about it a little bit and you come to an interesting conclusion. The Rebbe Rashab was overwhelmed by the pleasure of Vayemer Hashem El Avram. What kind of pleasure did Avram experience when Vayemer Hashem El Avram? So could we say that the Rebbe Rashab was deeply moved by the pleasure that Avraham must have felt? Then you think about it a little more. Vayemer Hashem el Avram, and that gave Avram incredible pleasure, sweetness. The Ebeshta came looking for him. The Ebeshta wanted him to be his. Come to my land, come with me. Great pleasure. And you think about it and you come to the conclusion, Vayemer Hashem el Avram. The Ebeshtet did this. The Ebeshtet came to Avram. 
how much pleasure did the Abishta feel? When the Abishta spoke to Avram, was it with pleasure? Great pleasure? Somebody wrote to the Rebbe Apirush in, um, in the davening. Atahu Hashem Levadecha. He says, you were completely alone, without a friend, without a Ohuv, without an Ohiv. So, and you were still alone. But then, now you have found yourself a friend and someone you love. So when the Ebrishta spoke to Avram for the first time, was it with pleasure? Was it with incredible pleasure? Was it with a tainug atzmi? So now you think again. When the Rebbe Rashab felt tainug, when he read those words, whose tainug was he feeling? So now we know something about the Ebesh that we didn't know before. Just an example of how Yediyah can stimulate Havana, and Havana brings a new Seichu. And then you fulfill the mitzvah of Yediyah Hashem.